Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Fan Zone Debate. We are here for a number one contenders match, a very exciting one. We got Jacoby Bancroft going up against Joe Fairley. Uh, most recently, we have seen Joe uh, take on Richard Schwartz and then take on Jack Pinchuk to earn his spot here last year. At the end of last season, we saw Jacoby go up against Coho and beat him in pretty dominant fashion uh, to get his spot here in the number one contenders match. So winner of this match will go on to face the champion uh, in one Mr. Cody Newberry. Uh, the loser of this match will find themselves into the uh, the, the next runt of uh, title picture contendees. So very exciting stuff. Uh, so it's not the end for either of these people, but... Could be a really exciting beginning uh, for the other ones. Like I said in his last couple matches, Joe has found a lot of success in fandom. And obviously, and even in Melee, he's had some really, uh, really good wins. Um, but he's never really found success here in debate until this season. He's made his way to the Contenders match. This is the farthest he's gotten. And I'm really excited for him. Jacoby's a former champion, though. And really dominant player so jacoby hasn't um had that like really really strong like get to the title uh match level win yet um since uh losing the belt but uh like i said uh, that last match against goho was impressive and now he's going up against joe so this is going to be crazy i'm looking forward to it these are really polite but also intense guys um so i'm looking forward to it kirk you're here. You know a lot about both these folks when it comes to debate, I think. Your thoughts on the match. Yeah, uh, this match, kind of like match I like to see. Jacoby, like you said, former champion, well-established as one of the upper, upper echelon players. Uh, and then you have Joe, who has been quietly improving, quietly getting more consistency. And I think he's poised to be one of those guys that gets that next level. So it'll be uh, interesting to see people coming from, you know, kind of two different spectrums uh, as far as debate has gone so far uh, for them. But I'm excited to see how this turns out and who moves on. Yeah. Mark, your thoughts on the matchup. Yeah, no, this should be interesting. Uh, Joe has been on a bit of a hot streak. You know, he's won his last couple of matches and, you know, just in general, I really like watching Jacoby play because, you know, we're going to get him in here. We're going to interview him. And he's going to be, you know, kind of kind of bubbly, all happy-go-lucky. And then, you know, he's going to get into the match. And, like, all that just kind of switches off. And it's just – he's very intense. And, like, it just it, – it's, it's, it's unsettling. But it is fun to watch. <laughs> I don't know if we're stroking their egos too much. But let's go talk to them first, starting with Mr. Joe Fairley. Joe, um, before the matchup. Uh, you had mentioned that it was uh, a certain time um, at your neck of the woods, and my wife went, in the morning? Um, so, Joe, I hope you're well-equipped to play this evening. Uh, how are your thoughts about going up against Jacoby and your first number one contenders match? I'm excited about this. Um, uh, Jacoby is a, a great, you know, great at debating, and I'm really looking forward to sort of taking this on. I think benefit here, like, say, Fandom's obviously where I've been very successful here in Multiplex. Melee, not so much, but here in the middle, I feel there's a nice middle ground. And hey, it's only four questions. It's not 30 like everywhere else. So, I've, And I've, I've had the time to prepare more than usual. Let's just hope that the time doesn't affect my ability to think on my feet. That's fair. All right. We will bring in Mr. Bancroft, Jacoby. Uh, Mark said that you unsettle him. Thoughts? Yeah, my wife's gonna call me on. That's gonna be her new nickname for me. It's like you're, just, you're unsettling now. So that's that's gonna be a lot of that's gonna be a lot of fun. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Does your no, wife but... also listen in on your matches? Is she like right across from me or something? Our, our space is kind of small, where it's hard for her not to hear. I always say, I always tell like, don't worry, I might not be too loud this time. I'm gonna try to keep it civil. And then that never. I'm just I, I doubt a whole lot. Maggie yeah. says heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's I'm like. Couch is over there, so it's like she could she could definitely hear things. Um, but no, I'm I'm yeah, I'm happy to be here. I love you know, um, I like being here, and I <laughs> like you know being the chance to play uh, someone like Joe, who's I just I just think he's you know uh, he's a he's a goat in the uh, in in fandom um, for for everything like that. So it's always nice to play new people and debate people you know who I haven't debated before. So uh, it's gonna be fun. So yeah, mm -hmm. let's let's do it. 
Okay, sounds good. Well, we are going to get into the match. Uh, Bucky is ready. So uh, we are going to get into it. Uh, here's how it's going to work. There are four questions based off of categories that the players drafted. Uh, they are going to debate those questions tonight before our very souls. They will get one minute to open, followed by a five-minute free form, followed by a one-minute closing at the end of the debate. Kirk, Mark, and I will write on our handy-dandy boards who we thought won the question and the debate if uh you get two out of three votes you win the point first person to three points wins the match so any questions from the players nope no nope. let's do it My computer is at 12%. So uh, I got to plug this in. We're going to start with the first category, which was drafted by Jacoby in the category of sports. The question is, oh, well, not what best fight. What is the best fight in the Rocky franchise? I will edit that as Jacoby is talking. Jacoby, you're going to open this up. With a one-minute opening, I will come in to give you a 10-second warning when the time comes. So, one minute when you start talking. The best fight in the Rocky franchise, I think, is the final Donnie Victor Drago fight in Creed 2. It's an incredible uh, fight from start to finish that sees Creed defending his name, defending his title, and defending his legacy. I think on paper, this was like a dumb sequel idea cooked up by Sly Stallone. It sounds super cheesy, but they are able to turn this into something which I think is pretty extraordinary. Just on a visceral level, this is the best fight. You feel every massive swing from the monstrous Drago, and you feel Donnie at first struggling to overcome this mountain. But it's the other things that also make this fight the best my opinion it's the it's the stylistic choices that give this fight some flair it's the fantastic use of the rocky music that the movie held out on us until the moment where he comes back ready to fight and it's the way that it surprisingly humanizes the dragos um so that they are allowed a small emotional victory even when donnie rightfully wins the fight every part of this fight works together beautifully and it's why it's the best fight in the rocky franchise it's the perfect cap of, for 40 years of storytelling to lead to this moment and it's the best fight all right, we are going to move over to Joe. Joe, you have one minute when you start talking. The Rocky franchise is filled with great fights, but for me, nothing tops that first fight between Rocky and Apollo Creed uh, from Rocky. This is a fight that hits every note of what a great on-screen fight can be. Firstly, you have the anticipation of the fight. It's so perfectly built up, so perfectly put in place. There's so actually very little boxing throughout the movie. So you don't really get a sense of these guys' styles, how these guys are going to fight. You just know this guy is a contender and this guy is the champ. And when they get on screen, they come together and have this fight. It's just, it, it, it does have that. It's just raw and it's powerful and you genuinely feel every single punch you see it from the very first punch just the way it gets the way it gets thrown the way it gets hit the way that the rounds go on you feel everything you see the pain on their face as everyone is every fight comes in it is fantastically filmed it's fantastically shot and of course you have one of the most unique endings in sports movie history time okay uh, so, uh, Rocky versus Apollo and uh, Donnie versus Victor Drago. Uh, guys, I will throw up the one minute warning when the time comes. I will throw up a let's move on if I feel like we need to move on, like you're talking too much. And uh, again, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to throw that up. Let your opponent talk. If you still aren't listening, I'm going to send Nick Tuig to your house. Don't let that happen. Uh, so, well, actually, that might be a pleasant visit, but in the cases of you nice gentlemen, but don't let it happen. Five minute free form when one of you starts talking. Um, I think uh, actually Rocky has the worst actual fight in the franchise, surprisingly, because I think because you even talked about it, you started with the, the anticipation for the fight is the best thing, but the fight itself is I think kind of lame. It has no energy, no sense of pacing that makes it a little confusing and it's a little boring. We skip so much of the fight. Your fight goes from round one, round two, immediately to round fifteen, and I think you lose a lot of the 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 momentum that you were talking about earlier in your fight. Whereas my fight, it's actually a good build, a good pace, a good everything to its conclusion. 
I want to touch on something you said, though, in your opening first, is that you feel every swing yeah. from Drago. I touched the word swing there because so many of the punches miss, especially early on in that fight. It's swing, 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 and miss. When I'm watching a fight, I want to see these punches connect, and you feel every connection in that Rocky Apollo Creed fight. You say it skips, but the, the point is, you're, as it skips, you're still seeing the effect it has on these people. You're still seeing every, the punches going. You're still seeing them happen. So many punches in your – it's not even a fight. It's just swing and a miss most of the time. I think I just disagree with with that because when Drago hits, he hits fucking hard. I'm sorry for cursing, but he I hits hard. It. He has a mountain. He slams you into them. And yes, but the point of the fight is 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 um, Donnie being able to dodge and weave and go through it and show that his speed can overcome while he digs into Drago with all of his might. You say you feel every. That's a weird argument, I think, to say you feel every punch in the Rocky fight because it looks like it's shot in the 70s. I don't fault it for that. I think it's just how it is. But the fight is slower. It's 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 not as fast paced. You just you kind of you they dodge and they weave. They don't block they just kind of let themselves get hit by fake punches i think that's not a good element of your fight is the actual boxing part the fight in rocky is not the good part of rocky Look, there are i give I'll probably, there are a couple of good punches in your fight scene the problem is like i said either swing and a miss most of the time or they look like they have no effect whatsoever so many of those punches have no effect whatsoever your fight also does skip part of the fight you know it's part of that it's it's, it's you know it's you've got to cut it down. There's, both of our fights have that, but the difference between the Rocky fight, I think, is firstly I'll get the way it's shot. It you know you're seeing through those ropes. You know it's putting you in that arena. It's putting you there. It's making you feel part of the fight. You know the lack of other fights at the beginning helps that anticipation. You know you, you the thing is we're building to this fight in your one. You know it's you know the revenge fight, but then you get that fight at the beginning where Drago you know basically cheats, but and. You know, you've, you've, got, you've already had it. You've already You're had saying, it, and then you get it again, and it's... Yeah. What do you mean you already had the fight? He loses the fight in spectacular fashion in the first time, and then you get his final revenge fight where he has to do the Rocky thing where train and get stronger and come back better than ever, which is done so perfectly in, in, in Creed 2. Rocky, you say, like, oh, we actually don't see a lot of boxing. Of we see a lot of, don't see a lot of Rocky uh, boxing in the first one because that makes the final fight good. Well, then your final fight has to be good, which is it's not. Yes, um, my fight transitions, and it moves forward through the rounds, and you actually see them... Um, which is what it becomes is a war of attrition. And that is also what your fight is billed as, is a war of attrition. Because the point of your fight is that Rocky can go 15 rounds, and we don't see that. We see him go two rounds, and then all of a sudden it's at the end. So it's supposed to be that war of attrition, whereas Creed 2, you actually see them through every single round going through where they barely have anything left in the tank, they barely have the chance to stand, and then Creed has to come back stronger than before and come back even with an injury. That makes it a better fight. And those hits are brutal in, in those fights. You feel them. I'm sorry, the hits, the hits are just as brutal in the Rockfighters. There's more brutal. In fact, nothing is more badass. Nothing is more, you know, showing how much these fights affect than the cut me scene in the, in that Rocky fight. You know, that is the, an awesome moment where you, that's how you are feeling it. You're seeing the effect it has on them, right? You're talking about the buildup as well, right? You've got Apollo as this champion, right? And you, you, you see that and then you get into that part of the fight where he's, you know, he thinks it's a show fight and he goes, oh, this guy doesn't, isn't treating it like a show fight. And then he starts going, you know, you see it's upper hand and it's upper hand. Each fight is taking the upper hand at different points in the fight. You know, most, for most of your fight, it is Drago with the upper hand and then eventually that overcome it. So that, that, that's a great fight is one where both fighters are at their top level. I don't feel like your fighters go the distance, whereas my fighters go the distance. You talk about buildup, first of all, is one of your big things of your point. Mine has 40 years of buildup. This is about the their, uh, Drago killing Creed in the in the ring in Rocky IV, and this He's coming back for him. Me. He's defending them before. He kills his father. This is a match that's been so long in the making. It's a buildup for that. So just your short movie buildup is different than my 40 years worth of buildup for both uh, Creed and for uh, and and for the Rocky character itself, you say there's nothing more badass than the cut me scene. I think when Creed's saying, like, I'm dangerous, you know, imitating his father beforehand, which he said in his first Rocky movie, is equally as badass. And Rocky and Creed pounding the ground, getting up from the thing, and laying out Creed, uh, laying out Drago with a broken rib is way more badass than Rocky in the corner saying, cut me. Well, let's, let's talk about the end of that fight. At the end of that fight, you see both my fighters have gone the distance. At the end of your fight, your manager just throws in the towel. Gives up. He gives up. All right. <laughs> Ooh. All right, Joe, we're going to start with you. You have one minute when you start talking. Uh, when it comes right down to it, when I watch a fight in a movie, I want to understand both fighters, their motivations, and why either side should and could win. And I want to be able to understand that from the movie I'm watching, not whatever, everything that has come before. The fight itself also needs to be great and evenly matched. In Rocky v. Apollo, uh, each takes the upper hand at various points in the fight. 
and the fight is so good, even when the fact that Rocky loses, it doesn't disappoint you. Adonis v. Victor is one-sided until Drago begins to tie and Adonis gets that final barrage in. It was always going to end one way. Predictability is boring. And you look at the end result of the fight, a split decision in my fight, you know, because both of the way both those fighters went. You know, even the commentator in Adonis versus Drago says, this is getting hard to watch. But by the end of my fight, the announcer calls it the greatest exhibition of guts and stamina ever witnessed in the ring and you can go all the way to the end of creed three and you still don't get a better exhibition than in rocky rocky versus apollo creed time okay we're gonna move over to jacoby jacoby you have one minute when you start talking your fight may have been billed in the movie as the greatest exposition match, but it would have been great to see that as an audience and we not skip over most of the fight when there's 10 minutes left in the movie where we skip from the first two rounds of the movie to the very final thing. We skip so much in that fight. My fight, you feel everything. It has, um, it's much better to watch from a narrative perspective. It has stakes. It has ebbs and flows. It has sl uh, Creed slowly gaining momentum and getting that injury that makes him weak uh, But after his rib gets bo broken and then he has to come back stronger and dig deeper in order to win. And then it doesn't end with a knockout. Uh, Joe criticized it's like, oh, because it ends with my manager throwing in the towel. That's great storytelling. It allows Donnie to win the fight physically, like he, and he deserves it, but it gives an emotional victory to um, Ivan and Victor, and it humanizes them in a surprisingly beautiful way where it shows Ivan letting him see his son as human for the first time in his life. Both fighters are able to walk away from this fight victorious in some way, and it's, and it's kind of great to watch in a fight, whereas you're seeing these punches land with ferociousness because Drago is a mountain, and Michael B. Jordan is a beast as well. They're throwing these punches they're connecting it's the best fight uh, in, in the rocky franchise rock whoa whoa in the rocky <laughs> franchise strike it from the record my god okay <laughs> <laughs> all right um enough well i lost my marker oh never mind here it is okay <sighs> Okay, uh, you guys ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Fucking fantastic. <laughs> I just want to stay. Um, this could be a title match if this is how <laughs> these guys are going to play. Uh, or maybe they just both really like Rocky. I don't know. Um, and this makes me want to go watch these movies because uh, both excellent picks. Um, both really great movies in and of themselves. Although Coho kind of turned me off of that whole Creed 2 poster thing for a really long time. <laughs> um, I went with Jacoby, and I think this was pretty much as close as you could get. Both did a really, really good job of building up their fight while tearing down the other, but I could not escape Jacoby's bashing of we skip over so much of Joe's fight. Um, I think that every pro that Joe had for his fight is totally valid 100%. But there was nothing about that that I, I heard that just I couldn't... Joe couldn't defend that in any way to me. Um, and so I went with Jacoby, but this was really, really close. I think that Jacoby did, just did such a good job of building up his fight talking about how great it was, especially in his closing, the emotional impact and how that towel throwing in isn't a negative, but a, a net positive on the fight, but also the characters and everything. Um, but also Joe's ending is weak. I, I, it was great. It, this was such a good fight in and of itself. So uh, Kirk, your thoughts. Yeah. Um, this tightened up for me a lot in the closing arguments. I think it closed. I think there's a gap and it closed up. Um, but I did ultimately have to go with Jacoby as well um, because I think that Jacoby, A, really did a good job of uh, deflecting jo Joe's attacks. You know, Joe came uh, at him with, you know, all the punches are missy, uh, were misses. And, you know, we see the fight in the middle of the movie before we see the big fight at the end. And Joe or uh, Jacoby explained why those are positives for his fight and what you know what those really meant and you know why those things were actually made his fight better and also uh, Jacoby really brought a lot of passion to the fight in describing 
uh, his match uh, in in the movie. I, I haven't seen either in a while, and Jacoby was the one as he described me. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember these moments. He's hitting the you know the the the, the points uh, that that the, the match hits. So um, I think Jacoby uh, Joe Joe did a really good job in his closed argument of tightening the gap, but I think um, Jacoby just wind it too too much in the uh, the main round. Okay, Mark, your vote doesn't count. Where would you have gone and why? Uh, yeah, fully agree with you guys, uh, Jacoby. Um, I think you guys uh, pretty much said all. I think um, I think the main thing for me was kind of piggyback on what Kirk said. Like, I'm not really sure if Joe got a really good, clean hit on Jacoby's argument throughout, just because I think Jacoby just surgically he he surgically de deflected every single hit Joe threw at him. He, and Joe threw a lot of stuff at him. And Jacoby did a great job defending everything. And I, and for that, like, yeah, it, it was, it was a solid call for me on Jacoby in this one. Okay. All right. Well, that means Jacoby goes up one to zero. We are going to move up to the next question. This was drafted by Joe. It's in the category of epic adventures. The question is, which epic adventure movie has the best action scenes in it? Scenes. Uh. Uh, so we are going to move over to Joe. You open this argument with a one minute opening when you start talking. The movies in the epic adventures category are just that. They are epic, filled with exciting journeys and thrilling action. But to see the best action scenes the ones that continue to thrill and excite their audience more than any other and still go on to inspire other action sequences. Um, you've got to go back to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, Raiders continues, uh, sorry, Raiders contains so many uh, iconic action sequences, uh, ones that continue to inspire from the opening temple scene, uh, which this day is still just a, an icon of an action sequence. Uh, the chase through Egypt, uh, India recovering art, the art from the Nazi convoy, uh, each action scene fleshes out uh, the fight in the bar. I've got to mention the fight in the bar. But each um, action scene not only is thrilling and exciting, propelled by a great uh, propelled by a great score. Um, each action scene also manages to flesh out uh, Indy and Marion as characters. You learn more and more about who they are. These scenes, even after forty three years, uh, continue to be the standard bearer for any action and adventure movie. Time, okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Jacoby. Jacoby, you have one minute when you start talking. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers begins with Gandalf plummeting down that cave hole, sword in hand, battling the fiery Balrog. Awesome way to start a movie. And I don't just want my argument to just be naming action scenes, but it's important for this movie to understand just how many amazing action scenes there are in The Two Towers. This is a movie with the orcs versus the Rohan riders shot from the perspective of hobbits, Merry and Pippin. Cool. You have the big evil dog warg creatures versus Aragorn on the heroes, which is a fun variety of horse versus beast battle that's also pretty funny with everything that Gimli does. You have the scene of the giant Nazgul attacking Faramir's uh, party with Frodo and Sam in the middle. You have the extremely satisfying scene of the Ents wrecking Isengard. And of course, the icing on the cake is the magnificent battle at Helm's Deep. One of the best large-scale battles battles ever filmed, ever. Without Helm's Deep, um, I think Two Towers has a case for greatness, but Helm's Deep, with all of its intricacies and amazing moments, plus every other scene that I mentioned with its variety means that Two Towers has the best action scenes in it time okay <laughs> cave hole really got me uh, <laughs> uh five minute free form one of you starts talking i think the benefit of raiders action sequences over you know two towers it's, it's and it's not just the fact that you know it is it, you know it's real it's sort of done for real but it's yours cgi i just think yours doesn't really inform the characters as much as mine does you know you've got that stuff with marion in the bar where you, you know, she's taking the drink while she's doing it that's a fantastic character moment the stuff with indy even just a small bit was shooting the guy with the sword the opening action scene was in the cave again it's all stuff that informs who this character is I disagree on both of your points. One, he's just like, yes, there is CGI in it, but Peter Jackson's very famously made very practical effects in his fights, and that's what makes them a very fantastic from start to finish. Also, the fact that you said that my fight, that my action scenes don't uh, flesh out the characters, yours just fleshes out Marion and Indy. Mine also flesh out Gimli, Legolas, Aragorn, Frodo, Sam, um, and and even Gandalf in his first fight. These all, it gives them personality, it gives them life, and it's we get to see them skill in it and develop throughout all of these battles, whereas uh, Indy is just like those two. Yours has great 
great action scenes. I really can't tear you down from that, but mine are just better in every way because of the production, the sound, and you know the, the feeling around them. I don't really see where the fleshing out is, but also I want to come back to the point about your scenes that it's very much, it's sword on sword, it's you know, it's it's fight scenes, whereas the action scenes in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you have the chase sequences, you have the fighting sequences, you have a car chase sequence, you have all this different variety of action scenes, and all of them are top tier, whereas yours, it's just different versions of fighting. Well, yours is different versions of a chase sequence, right? Like that's that's kind of what these movies are. Indiana Jones are chase movies in a sense, and and Middle Earth movies are battle movies, sword and sword. So yes, mine does have a lot of sword and sword, but they're freaking great in everything they're the best ever put to film um and in every single regard and they have to do some variety with it with it is cgi which i also think is some of the benefit for some of the bigger fights but also from from its lower scale battle sword on sword which i think are great whereas indie scenes they are just chase scenes from the bars to the to the outside areas which i mean like are cool and they look great i just don't think they're the best i don't really i don't want to say they're all chasing like the stuff in the bar there's, there's no chasing going on in the bar it's literally just it's a group it's the two versus the group in the bar um and also i think sound is also a very important part of, of, of a battle sequence nothing in the lord of the rings franchise nothing in any of your action sequences will ever compare to an indiana jones punch that is iconic it still remains iconic nothing that is done ever compares nothing in the two towers is more nerve-wracking than indy fighting the giant nazi while the plane spins and the fire is creeping towards the tanker you've got that sense of dread that sense of what is going to happen here was you multiple things going on but you can all follow it to point your so your scene at oskiliath is chaos and not chaos as in deliberate chaos it's very difficult to see to follow what exactly what is going on and see where going you know it's I, it, that's it's a messy scene i do, which which scene is messy just so i can dispute it really quick it's, it's the fighting in Oskilia, that action oh. sequence between the orcs, the, the elves and the helps. No, those scenes are very well put together. Peter Jackson is an excellent director in order to do with his lighting and his placement and his scene direction and everything about these movies are, are designed so you can watch these characters battle through it. And the feeling behind it is that they're Helm's Deep itself, which is the, the, the final battle, is the desperation there. You say like, oh, the, uh, the, the, the desperation that these characters feel. How about when the orc is charging with the bomb ready to go to blow up the wall and wipe out their whole defenses? What about when um, the, the orcs are busting through the door and then uh, Bernard Hill's character has to be like we, we're charging through we're going out we're facing the dawn and then gandalf rises around the corner and charges into battle these are the moments that make you feel something that make you feel strong and powerful and they're variety yes indiana jones movies make me feel excited but i think lord of the rings scenes make me feel all sorts of emotions from from that sort of despair to that sort of adventure to that inspiration to the frick yeah of watching big trees kill orcs you know like it's all great well i think that's that's the thing i mean you have mentioned a lot of stuff from helm's deep there but you know the way you know, I don't, I don't think the CGI of the war battle holds up very well. I think the way the bottle, like, like I said, the Battle of Ascaliath is filmed is very sort of chaotic. You know, and then in a franchise full of dragons and magic, somehow the most unbelievable aspect is the force in which a hobbit can throw a stone. You know, at that point, you you, you kind of checked out. You that for me, you, you've got this great battle at Helm's Deep, and then you cut to the Battle of Isengard, where it's just a little lackluster compared to compared to everything else that is going on. Whereas each scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, it's on point with everything else. It's spectacularly crafted, and it gives you that variety. It's, I, but I also think mine are spectacularly crafted, but in a different variety of ways. It's especially because with the feelings that they that they each make you feel in it. The Isengard scene is triumphant, and yes, Merry and Pippin on top of it throwing rocks at orcs, I think is pretty great, along with the, the despair of Helmsy. But then everything that comes before that, like the Balrog fight, like the horse versus warg fight, um, like the the big Nazgul kind of scene sweeping through the city, all that is varied and perfect for this uh, Middle Earth world that it is set in, and it is fantastic. And I can't, I cannot tear down Indiana Jones' action sequences. They're, they they are great, but mine are just a little bit better in every single regard and variety. All right. We are going to go to, oh, no. Whoops. We're going to go to Jacoby first. Jacoby, you have one minute when you start talking. I think the two towers has the best action scenes in a movie. I think every single criteria for better action scenes, I think it trumps Raiders. I think Helm's Deep, yes, which we talked a lot about, but it's an immaculate battle with a level of craft and detail and production that's unmatched compared to almost any other epic adventure movie. But also in that same movie, you get to see really fun things. Yes, the CGI is big, but it's awesome when you see Gandalf fight a giant fire demon. You see the fear of Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin as they're dodging orcs and dragons going everywhere. And then the extreme satisfaction of watching 
seeing these giant trees rage up against Isengard and just destroy everything. Raiders of the Lost Ark does have a lot of, like, I think iconic imagery, but I don't think that translates to best action scenes. Sure, they look great, but so do the Two Towers. And the Two Towers action scenes are packed with just as much humor, fun, intensity, and, and filmmaking skill as Raiders does, but it cranks everything up a notch. But um, I think when you look at my movie compared to Raiders, pound for pound, the two uh, the two towers has better action scenes overall. Time. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Joe. Joe, you have one minute when you start talking. Raiders of the Lost Ark showcases multiple action sequences of different types. Escapes, one-on-one -on -one fights, two people versus many fights, vehicle chases, each one expertly crafted uh, and with a different threat being faced each time. The action in Two Towers, while for the most part well-crafted, become largely one-note, heroes versus villains, sword on sword. While Helm's Deep does stand out in the movie, the rest of the action scenes are pretty forgettable. Lost Gilead is chaotically put together, Isengard is a little bit dull, Faramir and his men versus the Oliphant is over before it even starts. Uh, each scene in Raiders is a spectacle, fun, exciting, memorable, and showcasing something different. Like I said, you've got this the fight with the Nazi by the plane where the fire screaming towards giving you that sense of dread. You've got this sense of excitement coming from this opening chase with the poison darts flying and the boulder coming along. And each scene develops those characters. You get the stuff with Marion of her taking the drink before she goes into that fight. And you have the stuff with Indy, his, improv his improvisational skills, which inform the whole character throughout. Um, everything showcased is just beautiful and perfect. Time. Oh, Lord on high. Okay. That was good. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. Where the fuck is my marker? Um, Bucky. Oh, here it is. Bucky jumped up and I never erased Jacoby from the last one. So, okay. See, that's not a good side. <laughs> I drop. I drop my Bucky is being a, a menace to society. Frankly, while well, drinking yeah, his he juice, knocked, he knocked over my eraser. Um, no, the sign should be that it's close. I'm still thinking, and it's empty. Um, Okay. Um, are you guys ready? Yep. We're going to start with Mark. Cool. Um, this one's a really close. I I was going back and forth the, the whole time on who I was going to go with. Honestly, it just came down to closings. I had a leaning Joe. Just uh, I, can't see. I think a lot of it kind of came down to how Joe closed. I think, and especially kind of when I think earlier on we kind of talked about just kind of how, like I think Joe, I think Joe also did a bit. He did a better job, I think, of kind of tearing down Jacoby scenes just a little bit in some sense. And I think especially in the end, I was convinced at least Raiders having the variety of the action scenes, and I feel like he at least displayed at least a couple times throughout how a lot of Jacoby scenes are a, a bit of the same. There's a there's like a, there's a lot, a lot of the same like we see in there. So I just think I, I gave the slight edge to Joe here. Okay, uh, <laughs> I have many thoughts. Uh, I love both these movies. Both these movies are five out of fives to me. Um, pretty per as perfect of movies as you can get. At one point, someone mentioned like Peter Jackson not directing well, and Maggie went. Don't talk about him as a director. Uh, I thought that was very funny. Um, <sighs> neither of you picked the right answer. The answer is Return of the King. Fuck. <laughs> um, <sighs> I went with Joe. And I'm shocked to say it because I prefer Two Towers really slightly. Like, I think they're really close. Um, Raiders is one of my favorite movies of all time um but two towers barely edges it out that being said i think that joe made a really good argument for the action scenes that jacoby was talking about actually aren't that great other than helm's deep and the raiders scenes are uh 
this wasn't like an end all be all like it seemed like it maybe was for mark the variety part like it definitely helped uh i think the variety of uh one-on-one -on -one, plane v1 two v many like that was a good point but i think uh joe overall just did a better job of like contextualizing and explaining his scenes and making me excited to go watch that um versus going to re-watch anything other than the helms deep um and i could be totally off base here this is me just being the the tim asshole that i am but like i feel like jacoby's pick of two towers is definitely based on helms deep and then let's look at the other action scenes whereas joe picked raiders based off of well let's look at every scene and kind of take it for what it is and i think joe kind of helped exemplify that so joe gets the point um kirk your vote doesn't count where would you have gone i also went jf oh um, whoa yeah. <laughs> Double clean, um, clean sweet beach uh yeah i I feel like, like I said in the last fight where Jacoby got me more excited to watch his Rocky fight, um, Joe got me more fired up for his action scenes and his descriptions. Um, I think Joe came out on the offensive and was just ready, and it turned into, you know, Joe would say this, 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 and a lot of it was Jacoby saying, well, mine does that too, or mine doesn't do that, or, you know, just kind of like bouncing off. So I think Jacoby, or Joe just kind of like took control of this fight uh, right out of the gate. Um, there's a, and there's some, you know, when I'm judging – on certain topics in my mind, I create a checklist of things somebody has to say to kind of get the point for me. And Joe just hit all those talking about the practical, practical effects, the variety. I love how you talked about the sound and the one thing Jacoby said, he, he, he admitted, I can't knock your scenes. And J Joe did a really good job of knocking the two tower scenes enough to, to, um, to win the argument. I've got to say, I'm always pretty confident in my votes it feels better when it's a clean sweep. Uh, we're all like in agreement. Like we love you, Jacoby, but like it feels better when we uh, we're not the odd man out. Um. Anyway, don't worry, Kirk. Talk. I'll mention the practical effects in the next in the next picture. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. yeah, we made we made you excited last time. Now, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it's time to get depressed, guys. Uh, we here at Fan Zone Debate, we love to laugh. We love to have fun but it's time to be sad uh the question is in the category of pixar <laughs> the question is what is the saddest moment in a pixar film and oh boy are there many uh so this was drafted by uh jacoby so jacoby you get one minute to open your argument when you wait hang on god damn it bucky he knocked my phone over. I'm so sorry. And wow. that's my timer. Um, no, I'll just watch the clock up here. Okay. One minute when you start talking, Jacob. You don't you can wait. I can you can get okay. I'll just okay. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. Uh the saddest moment in a Pixar movie is Marlon losing his family in the opening of Finding Nemo. It's it's devastating to watch and perhaps more horrific when you just really stop to think about it. Marlon lost over 400 children who were just days away from being born. Imagine that for one second. Losing just one child is the worst thing imaginable. But 400 children all days away from being born? On top of that, he loses his wife, his one true love, and couldn't do anything to help her as her and his 400 children were ripped apart by a big scary fish. Want to know what makes that even worse? It was Marlon's fault. We see him saying how he was the one who insisted that he and his wife move to that location against her hesitations because he wanted the best spot for his children and his family. Ouch. And this event leaves his one surviving son injured for the rest of his life and turns Marlon into a paranoid husk of a fish that totally alters his psyche going forward and turns him into this paranoid fish going forward. That's sad. It's sad in the moment and it's sad how it sets up this character going forward. It's sad in every way that you can imagine Marlon losing his family is the saddest moment of time. I still didn't find my phone. Uh, okay, we're going to bring over uh, Joe. Joe, you have one minute when you start talking. Uh, Pixar movies are filled with tragic moments. And for the most part, those tragic moments lead to something hopeful. Um, true sadness comes from the death of hope. And that's why the married life segment in Up is by far and away the saddest moment in any Pixar movie. Um, Unlike other sad Pixar moments, this move, moment starts out hopeful. 
and ends with all hope lost. Uh, each time we see another aspect of Carl and Ellie's married life, something is going wrong, chipping away at those savings, chipping away at their hope, the heartbreak of child loss is something that easily could destroy any couple, but they persevere. And then that's taken away until finally, yeah, until finally Ellie is taken away from Carl and he is left alone, devastated and totally devoid of hope. And one of the worst things about this is that everything that happens to them cannot be stopped. It cannot be controlled. It cannot be helped. And it's for a movie, for a movie aimed at families and at children, to have these sad things happen that cannot be controlled is absolutely devastating. Time. All right, guys. Well, you picked two sad ones. Uh, five minute free form when one of you starts talking. You know what I see when I watch that married life sequence and up a pretty fulfilling life. I would argue there's actually a lot of happiness in that opening. Carl and Ellie spend 70 years together making a life selling balloons and playing with animals. And their love for each other is deep without you say that their hope gets chipped away each time it doesn't. But that's not true. Every time they they're, they're, they revisit each other, they're smiling at each other. They're dancing together. They're doing chores together. Their love remains strong. You know who would have liked 70 years with his best friend? Marlon. But he can't because his whole family wife and 400 kids were wiped out well that's the issue we don't actually see how long marlon and coral spent together you know you are thrown in to this point of their relationship when you are you see before the married life segment as i would talk about the married life segment so specifically after the marriage everything that comes before that with carl and ellie is that wonderful it's that build up of hope and then you hit that married life segment and that jar of savings that is the metaphor for the hope that is the metaphor for what is being chipped away in their relationship everything that happens with it's the car breaking down the tree hitting the thing the other stuff which i'm not i'm not comfortable with mentioning again we, we just not it's just it's that chipping constant chipping away but by the end of your scene marlon is left with hope by the end of my scene carl is left devastated. he has something whereas carl has nothing he has something, yes, but he has a kid that after he lost everything he does and it turns him into just a, to, to, to a paranoid husk. But everything about that, you say like the chipping away at the hope. Watch how my scene devolves from color to utter starkness as Marlon is left alone. But watch your scenes as you say everything happens like when they're breaking their savings in order to do it. You know what they're doing at each other? They're looking at each other like, oh, shucks. Like <laughs> that's unfortunate. But she's still tying his tie every day. They're still doing their dances. They're still going together. And even when they go their moments of ultimate sadness, when they can't conceive a child, they it comes back even stronger than it does because their love is strong because they have each other throughout and they smile and their love is there throughout. Marlon is left devoid of any love from his wife and his thing. You say they're thrown into that relationship, but they're not. We get a little sneak peek before that when he says, like, remember how we first met? He's he's remembering how he met the true love of his life moments before she's ripped away from him tragically after she's defending his kids and they all die. That's sadder than spending the 70 years of happiness and sadness together. I think that's the problem with it. They're mentioning it, but you're not seeing it. As an audience, we are seeing that Carl, that Carl and Ellie getting together. We're seeing that. And then we are having that hope chipped away. We are having these moments taken away. The beginning of it up brings you into this relationship fresh. You watch it blossom only to have it all whipped away. We've known Marlon and Coral all of 10 seconds before it all goes wrong. Yeah, and that's and that shows how effective Pixar can be. We know Ellie and and uh, Carl six minutes before everything goes wrong. The timing doesn't matter, but Pixar is able to get that emotion from you no matter what the scene is, and you feel their love story together. You feel Marlon's excitement about being a father and the type of man that he is. And he still gets to be a father. Yes, he does still get to be a father, but it's without his love and it's without the kids. And, it, and he turns into like a, a very paranoid husk about protecting his child who is injured from his fault. That is sadder than Carl and Ellie. Yes, he loses his best friend out of 70 years, but 70 years together with the person that you love most has a lot of joy in it. Everything is ripped away from Marlon before his life fully begins. And that's what makes my moment sadder. No, because when you look at Carl, you see the way that Ellie's death affects him affects him you see the way these things are actually affecting him yes he's having his tie straight deep but every time he looks at ellie you see that thing in her heart she is not realizing her dream she is not getting her dream because every time something keeps going wrong you see the, what it does to carl because i'm talking about how this is a sad moment specifically for carl and the audience because carl is seeing what these little things are doing to ellie he, he wants to help her realize her dream and he never gets to do it. he gets to do it in a spirit but he never gets to do it properly because every time it is chipped away and then they go and try and realize a new dream something away from this, away from going to paradise, world, away from that, and even that is torn away from them, right? When you finally go, actually, we're not going to realize this dream, we're going to realize this dream, is that no, we can't realize that. And by the end of it, Carl is left sitting in that church completely alone, devoid of all hope. 
And and so and Marlon is left with his disfigured and hurt damaged son from his fault, swearing that he's going to protect him no matter what, after promising to, you know, name all of his children that were ripped away from him, all 400 children and, uh, and his wife and his love. He didn't get to spend the time that Carl got to spend with his life. And yes, Carl's moment is sad. I'm not like that. That is moment that his, when he loses his friend after so long. Yes, that's, unf- that's, that's, that's devastating. But it's it. But if you look back at that moment and actually watch that scene, they're never sad throughout those seven years together they're they're so happy as they get to experience everything that they can together the a, a full uh, spectrum of emotions and happiness even during the sads because they have each other marlon does not in that sequence because before he's able to get to that level like carl and elion it's taken away from him in the most tragic and devastating quick scene because tragedies happen so fast they do and sometimes these things build up their it, it, sometimes you, you you know you're trying to maintain that that's the worst thing right you can have what you can have this hope and then it can be torn away from you and then all of a sudden straight away it's back that's what happens to marlon but with carl every single time he tries to have hope it's chipped away more and more and more until he is left with absolutely nothing but his wife's by his side whoa uh <laughs> we are gonna go to holy shit we're gonna go to joe uh joe you get to close first you have one minute when you start talking Sad things happen all the time, especially in Pixar movies. Uh, what sets up apart, not only from Finding Nemo's, but from every other sad moment in Pixar, is that the story being told not only builds the hope in that character up, it builds uh, up the hope of the audience. Uh, everything pre-married life shows off and builds this beautiful relationship, but um, everything that follows the wedding is an escalation of disasters that tears down both its protagonist and its audience. By the time the moment is over, both are left completely devoid of hope. The true sadness is the death of hope. And given that Nemo moment ends on a hopeful note, you hear it in Marlon's voice when he discovers that egg, that one egg that survived. And he goes down and he says, Nemo, you can hear the hope in his voice. When you cut to Carl in that church, surrounded by balloons, but surrounded by absolutely no one, left alone, you realize you everything you have just seen has been ripped away from you and it has been ripped away from Carl. And that's what leaves him time devastated we're gonna go to jo- uh jacoby jacoby you have one minute when you start talking On one hand, you have an old man losing his best friend after living 70 mostly happy years together. Yes, you know, there were hiccups and throughout the road, like, um, but I think Joe is wrong when he says, like, it chips away at their well being because it doesn't, because they have each other and they're happy throughout all these moments. Um, it's not as sad as it could be because they get to spend it together. Marlon is a character who has his wife and 400 children murdered in front of him. Joe says, like, Carl had his le- moment, like, ripped away from him. No, you know who really had stuff ripped away from him? Marlon, in an instant, he lost his wife and almost all of his children that is the sadder moment there's no real consolation prize like there is with up you know the colors are shifting drastically in this world that marlon lives in from this bright and colorful to drab and jeery and paranoid and focused um and because because he wakes up in darkness alone before he got to spend that life yes one kid survives he does have somebody with him but he's injured with his hurt fin and now marlon is a husk of the clownfish that he was and it's marlon's technical fault it was his decision that caused this it's way sadder than up in almost every way you know it's it, it's a great, up's a great secret. Uh, finding Nemo said it. Uh, finding Nemo, whatever the fuck he said. Bring <laughs> it from the record. Uh, okay. Well, I'm depressed, boys. I don't know about you. Uh, I don't know that uh, Andrew Stanton and Pete Docter ever wished this upon anyone, but maybe they did. Um Okay, I'm ready. Uh, other judges? Yeah. Okay, Kirk, you are kicking this one off. This is by far the hardest one so far, and yeah. for me anyway. And I hate to do this because they I have to pick somebody, uh, but they both did enough to win the point. So it's that close where I feel like I'm taking the point away from somebody who deserves it. But it was so close because they both argued it very well, and they both kind of – came from different angles. You know, Jacoby was like, well, your guy had a full life 
but it ends really, really sad. And, you know, Finding Nemo situation was probably might have been sadder, but at least there's hope at the end. There's something there at the end, even though the in between is more tragic. So um, how do you pick that? I don't know. Um, I ultimately went with JB Jacoby and I'll tell you why. Um, the one thing that put me over, because I had to grab onto something, the fact that he mentioned it before and he mentioned his closing argument, the fact that Marlon is responsible for what happened. I think to me is the one thing that got brought up that tipped it 49.99999% to 50.11111. So um, that's what I had to go with. I feel bad about it because it was so close, but I had to, I had to make the choice. Sorry, Joe. Mark. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I kind of felt like there, there was a bit of a gap in this. And then honestly, kind of as the fight went on, it, it got pretty narrow especially by the time we got to the closings, it was pretty neck and neck. I kind of similar to Kirk. I, we did go with Jacoby on this one as well. I, I, I think I just can't get over at least with like it just Jacoby's core argument of everything happening in an instant and how our, like Marlon is a character. Everything has changed for him in one instant. It's his fault. And this one moment kind of defines everything throughout the entire film. And I think it's one thing I, that I just couldn't really shake throughout this whole argument. And that's where, I mean, that that's honestly what, what gave Jacoby the point for me. Okay. Uh, my vote doesn't count. Uh, but... We're three for three on clean sweeps tonight, boys, because I also went with Van Croft. <laughs> Um, yeah, this was messed up. I don't know why I did this to you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when I wrote the question, the first thing I thought of was take her to the moon for me. But compared to like what you guys are saying, that's got like nothing on this. Um, I thought that uh, Kirk put it really well. I uh, from the get go, I was like, oh, losing all these children fucked up. Joe, though, was able to really, really, like, nail out why the the Up. And I've been on record saying I don't love the movie Up. Like, everyone loves it. I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, so going into it, I was like, <laughs> Nemo, got it. Joe really convinced me. Um, but I think, Jacoby, the uh, what Kirk said, that, like, that this is Marlon's fault which i've never really thought of it that way but he's not wrong and that's what makes jacoby such a great debater is like he can think of these types of things that it really put a different perspective on it i thought joe played this fantastic though because uh i agree with uh jacoby in that when joe submitted his answer i was like oh they got so many years together fuck that shit um but joe was able to really convinced me and it was just it was it this was very close this could have been a title match this is nuts uh guys another clean sweep i'm gonna take out mark and kirk we are moving on to the next question uh joe needs to hit this in order to send it the bonus um the category Give the winner the belt. Hey, Cody, that's up to you, man. Uh, you could come in and win and play something. I don't know. Uh, it's in the category of I want to say comedy. I don't know. Yeah, was it comedy? Yeah, great. Yes. I, I erased that part. Um, I'm excited for this one. Nick Tuig won't be. What is the best human performance in a Muppet movie? It's time to light the lights. Uh, so Joe, you get to kick this one off. One minute opening when you start talking. I actually think stepping into the world of the Muppets as an actor is actually no mean feat. Most performances are overwhelmed by those of the Muppets themselves. But in almost every movie, there is uh, one human performance that stands out and stands, um, stands above. And none more so for me than Amy Adams in 2011's The Muppets. Uh, most human performances in these movies are there to do one thing. Uh, Charles Grodin is there to be arch and villainous. Tim Curry to be joyfully menacing. Michael Caine to be 
grumpy than joyful. But Amy Adams not only manages to show off a wide range of, of emotions and talents, um, she hits each one with this amazing energy, making it the best, most well-rounded performance in any Muppet movie. She manages to hit dramatic notes, emotional notes, joyful notes, funny notes, singing is incredible. And I think that is what sets Amy Adams apart from any human in any Muppet movie. She's in full control, showing her full range of talents. It's why she has been Oscar nominated. It is why she continues to act at a high level to this day. Time. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Jacoby. Jacoby, you have one minute when you start talking. Uh, there's always that joke tweet that goes around during the holidays about how Michael Caine is acting his butt off in Muppet Christmas Carol and treating everybody like a real human. That's funny, but really that highlights just how great of a human performance Caine gives in Muppet Christmas Carol. This movie does not work without Michael Caine, and he fully commits to the full spectrum of human emotions here, from bitter and mean to regretful and sad to joyful of happy – all of it, Kane does pretty terrifically. He is not one note in this film, but has to go through the entire Scrooge character arc in a Muppet movie. And that's another thing that makes, I think, Kane like a shoe in for best human performance. He is convincingly playing one of the most famous characters of all time, a daunting task, and he crushes it. He's not only acting great, but also gives us a worthy live action Scrooge, which I think should factor in here. We see him torn up and fearful over his bitter existence and desire to change in the same movie where he yells at rats about being unemployed it's an excellent human performance and i think it's the best one in a muppet movie because of every of all the theatricality and and gravitas but also funniness humor and warmth that kane brings to the role of scrooge but also add on scrooge to a muppet movie it's the best uh right. oh you've learned okay uh five minute free four and one of you starts to i think the problem is can you get this performance regardless of there being Muppets present. I think that's the biggest issue. We're talking about the best performance, best human performance in a Muppet movie. I want you, you need to embrace the fact that you are in a Muppet movie. He is giving a Scrooge performance that could be done without Muppets present. I think the difference with Amy Adams is that not only is she showcasing this wide range, she's embracing that world of the Muppets. See, but the character itself of that Amy Adams plays is so one note. She's playing the boring, gentle love interest, and she plays that really well. I'm, she does. I know that Amy Adams is a really good actress, but I think that character is so simple that like anybody could have played her. Like like if you swap her with like Isla Fisher or Bryce Dallas Howard, there is no noticeable difference in that performance because the character is just nice and sweet and gentle. Whereas Kane has to go hard. Yes, he is giving a very big performance in that because he has to because he is Scrooge, the the most famous character of all time, the most famous evil to good transformation ever and he nails it and he captures that joy and when you're saying that he doesn't work well in a Muppet movie uh, Kane says this is Fozzie Wig's old rubber chicken factory so excellently it's like the best line reading ever in a Muppet movie so I don't think that argument will work one one great line, uh, one great line reading you know doesn't make a great performance I think we've seen so many interpretations of the Christmas Carol story what makes the Muppet Christmas Carol stand out isn't Michael Caine's performance, it is the Muppets around him that, ele that brings that movie and that elevates that movie. Adams is much more well You say it's one note, it's not one note. You say she's just a boring, gentle love interest. That's completely that's completely not true. You see the pain in her. You see that, that, that firstly, that joy, that excitement of we're going to go to LA and he's going to propose. And then it comes down to, oh no, he's always off with his friend. And you see that sort of devastation. You know, Caine is not going to sit there and perform me party. Like Amy Adams does that. And she, even in that song, she goes through that whole spectrum of emotions of, joyful and happiness but also i'm also very sad and this relationship isn't working for me you see that pain in that what you that's what you get from amy adams it's not a one note performance at all yeah but you're saying like like kane isn't like that important to, to the scrooge movie whereas when then amy adams like again remove her from this movie does that really affect the the joy of the movie you say like oh the muppets elevate muppet christmas carol amy adams does not elevate the muppets but michael kane does elevate the uh, the muppet christmas carol because of his central performance of being this bah humbug character to this very joyful thing you can't say oh amy adams goes from sad to happy in that when you have ebenezer scrooge the character known from going to the lowest depths of seeing how his own 
death plays out and everybody freaking hates him from it and then begging for his life back and knowing that he's going to change and then coming back even stronger and nicer and the nicest person around. Kane does those two things excellently. Two opposite ends of the spectrum. Scrooge and joyful change person. Amy Adams stays basically in this bubble the whole time of joyful, happy. I'm a little sad, but I'm happy. And she's not central to the performance of, of the Muppet movie. Michael Caine does something different um, in his performance, but it, it accentuates the Muppets in, in a great parallel track. It doesn't accentuate the Muppets. What he does is he plays Scrooge as Scrooge, and the Muppets do their funny things around that. The funny moments, the great moments, which what you want from a Muppet movie, come from the Muppets. They do not come from Scrooge. Whereas Amy Adams, she has her emotional moments, she has her character moments, but she also has the funny moments where she's joining in with the Muppets in those joyful moments. And it's, you've also got to add in, it's a Muppet movie, you've got to enjoy the scene. Michael Caine cannot sing. That's part of the performance. And that is where it falls, and that's where that performance falls down. Whereas Amy Adams, she can sing. And she gives that. You are not going to get Michael Caine doing me part. You're not going to get Michael Caine doing Mana Mana. You are not going to get that because he cannot do it the reason he has to act the reason he has to say i have to treat the muppets like humans is because that's the only way he could do it whereas amy adams could do it because she treats them like muppets because that's what you should do in a muppet I, movie i disagree with the idea that you can be too serious and dramatic for a muppet movie especially for a muppet movie retelling a christmas carol with ebenezer scrooge when you're gentle and sweet like amy's amy adams character you blend in with literally every other character in that movie every other person is treating muppets like muppets and that's great that's fine but you're forgotten and you're unimportant kane's performance drives the movie and he brings his theatrical theatrical gravitas background to give us one of the best live action Scrooges. It's a fantastic performance. And it's also just done also in a Muppet movie itself. It brings out the humor of the Muppet movie while the classic tale of, of, of a Christmas Carol. And it does so and it blends it perfectly because of, you know, of, of Kane's performance. Yes. And you keep saying Kane can't sing me party. I don't want him to sing me party. Let's I want him to play Scrooge convincingly and it does it great. It's not just me, but he cannot sing. The songs he sings in that bring that performance down. You know, you are part of this Muppet movie. You are you are needing to bring a well-rounded performance. I never said you couldn't be serious and dramatic. I said you have to, when you're being giving a performance in a Muppet movie, you have to be bringing the serious and dramatic whilst also bringing other things to the table. And that's where, his, that's where the performance falls down. He does have those joyful moments, but what it doesn't do, it doesn't embrace the world of the Muppets, which is what you want from a human performer in a Muppet movie. You get it from all the cameos in the other movies. Time. Okay, Jacoby, we're going to start with you. You get one minute to close when you start talking. Being a human in a Muppet movie is interesting. You always have to pretend you're acting against real people, and it's easy to slip into the whimsy, silly world the Muppets inhabit, and that's fine. Most actors do slip into that safe, goofy territory with a knowing, you know, wink to the audience. They're having fun. But Kane makes an interesting choice. Yes, he also has a lot of fun at the end when he changes into the, his good character, but he plays Scrooge so seriously in his first half, and that greatly benefits the first half of the movie where Scrooge is his stereotypical evil self. And then we get to see Kane evolve the character, going from nostalgic to having that change of heart to sad to broken to hearing how he'll he'll beg that that he'll promise he keeps christmas in his heart all year long and you believe it because the performance is so good amy adams is a great actress playing a character that's kind of supposed to be bland and safe it's not the best human performance in a muppet movie michael kane gives it his all yes he is serious and yes he treats it like these these are human characters around it but that's what you need in a muppet christmas carol adaptation joe was saying like oh it's because it's not doesn't fit for a muppet movie but it fits perfectly for a muppet christmas carol ad ad adaptation time okay we're gonna move over to joe joe you have one minute to close when you start talking amy adams throughout the muppets gets to show off a wide range of acting talents uh, from musical to joy to comedy and drama of different varieties you've got her questioning her relationship you've got that anger you've got that sadness you also get that joy she has from helping to bring this 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 show together michael kane hits good dramatic beats uh, but until the one final scene where he gets to be jovial it's largely the one note performance of being grumpy when looking at the best performance, a performance that hits top marks across the board will always trump one that's only great in that sort of one department. Amy Adams is a great performance across the board. From the range that she shows in The Muppets of that anger, of that sadness, of that joy of their being able to sing, you could do a gender swap Muppet Christmas Carol and put Amy Adams in that role. What you could not do is put Michael Caine in Amy Adams' role because he cannot embrace that world of The Muppets. He has to do a performance on his terms because he does not have the skills, he did not have the ability to join that Muppet world. That's the difference. Amy Adams shows off that 
full range of talents whilst embracing the world, whereas Michael Caine doesn't. It could just be a live action movie. Time. Are you checking to see if I have that one already? You, I love you so much. Uh, sorry, I was talking to Maggie. Uh, she's doing something for me. Um, fuck, guys. When you drafted the Muppets, I wasn't pleased. <sighs> These are both five out of five movies. I have it already. Ah, oh, throw it away. All right. Mark, are you ready? You look confused. Uh, give me a second. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, you say I have cord trash ever? I don't know if you guys know this. Totally off topic. The Macaw um, has more Star Wars memorabilia for someone who doesn't like Star Wars. You like BB-8 and Grogu. Got a lot of and stuff. I'm just saying. Uh, uh, I'll be able to that shoots out a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> this sucks, guys. Um, upon um, the Muppets 2011 is my favorite Muppet movie. It's arguably top five my favorite movies. Are you time. going first? Yeah. Is it your turn? Yeah. Okay, I thought I went last last time. I'm sorry. Okay, good. You did. So now it's my turn. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, that being said, I think Michael Caine in Muppet Christmas Carol was the obvious choice. So this was tough. I went with Joe Fairley. Uh, color me shocked. I thought that his argument of Amy Adams... Which, again, like, it, it, this is tough when you know so much about the category being given, but you have to go based off what the arguments are. Joe painted the picture of Amy Adams as giving this complex, varied performance um, that is not one note. She's doing comedy. She's doing drama. She's doing her whole performance is comedy. But Joe painted it very much... It's multi-purpose, and Jacoby didn't really refute that. Um, and I thought that Jacoby, he did a good job of Muppet Christmas Carol and uh, Michael Caine and saying that, you know, he does fit within the movie that he's in. But I thought that Joe did a great job of just being like, he's kind of one note. Like, yeah, maybe he doesn't fit in the Muppet movie, or maybe he does, but... His performance is very one note, and that's part of the character until the end. He can't sing. He doesn't do the things that fit in a Muppet movie, and Amy Adams is hitting all the marks. Um, I don't like it, but that's where I voted. <laughs> so, uh, Kirk, where are you going? Um, well, whatever happens, we're breaking the clean sweep streak because I want Jacoby. I want Jacoby. There you go. Um, I feel that... Um, in my opinion, Jacoby just expressed a better philosophy of what a human's supposed to do in a uh, Muppet movie. I do think the better human performances are the ones where they act like they're not acting with Muppets. And a lot of Jacoby's uh, or a lot of Joe's argument was, well, she fits in with the Muppets. And I think that was that to me that actually hurt his argument. And Jacoby uh, kind of hit that. Um, I disagree. I think Jacoby did a good job of talking about how. Um, Amy Adam was a safe performance and uh, you know, if, if she was doing range, so was Michael Cain. And also Jacoby really did a good job of saying it's a good performance in the Muppet movie, but it's also just a very good performance in general. So kind of hit both points on that. Uh, so for me, it was another good argument, but I like Jacoby. Okay. Uh, Mark. And Charles Grodin's the right answer, one. by the way. What was that, Kirk? Charles okay. Grodin's the right answer, by the way. I don't disagree with that. I, I, I feel that. Uh, we're going to go over to Mark. Mark, are we moving on to the speed round, or is the match uh, over? Well, um, first of all, I need to say I, I don't really care about the Muppets. So the fact <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> the fact that we're ending with me on this question is, is very funny to me. Um, 
uh, it's that means like just going by the argument, it was very close. Honestly, it's probably the closest one we had today. Um, I went back and forth, and honestly, I we're gonna go to a speed round, guys. I did go with Joe. Wow. Um, okay. I I think I think Joe kind of won me over just a little bit on that end of just. I think at the end of the, he sold me how Amy Adams I think is important to the Muppets movie, and how in a sense you could probably do the Muppet Christmas Carol without Michael Caine, probably still get the summer movie, but Amy Adams needs to be there. I think it's kind of the one thing that just kind of got me at least with Joe. It's tough when you have to go based off the arguments, not what you think as a debater. Uh, okay, this was nuts, and guys, we're going to the speed round. Oh, man. I hate this. Uh, okay. So here's how the speed round is going to work. Uh, I randomized what uh, side of fan zone this was going to come from, uh, whether fandom or uh, May zone. Uh, and I, you don't like that one. And I uh, randomized the category within the side of fan zone uh, that we're going from. So. I'm going to say the question. You are going to get to uh, then. Re- I'm going to then repeat the question. You are going to decide uh, who is going first based on who answers first. So whoever answers first will go first. And then whoever answers second will go second. You're going to get 30 seconds and then 15 seconds. Um, does everyone understand the rules? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The side of fan zone that was randomized was fandom. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, I know. Trust me, it's not going to get better. Oh, no. Uh, the category was Wizarding World. <sighs> Actually, that's not terrible. For just- yeah. Better than Middle Earth. Yeah. <laughs> Frank. Frank, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the category of Wizarding World fandom, the question is... Who is the best Wizarding World character that's not Harry Potter? Jeez. Who is the best Wizarding World character that's not Harry Potter? Um. I'll go with I'll go first. I'll say Hermione. Okay. <laughs> Never long bottom. Okay. I'm going to take out Kirk. I'm going to take out Mark. I'm going to stay on screen to give you guys your 10 second countdowns when they come. Uh, just a reminder uh, you get your 45 and then your 30. So, Jacoby, you get Wait. your. Sorry, we said 45. I thought you said 30 and 15. What is the I think that was totally fucking wrong when I said that. It is 45 and 30, right? Kirk, Cody, 45 and 30. Don't if, you I said 30 and, <laughs> if I said 30 and 15, that was a mistake. It is 45 and 30. 45. Um, that changes everything. I oh, my God. Okay. Oh, no. Jacoby, you get 45 seconds when you start talking. <laughs> Hermione is a great individual character as herself. She's strong, she's confident, she's smart, she's independent. And that on her own makes her so awesome to watch and and progress throughout all these movies. But what also makes her great as as an equal pillar to that is her dynamic with the the, the, the core three. She is the lifeblood of the entire, basically the franchise, because without her, nothing happens. Absolutely nothing. Harry and Ron die in the first three minutes of of doing anything without Hermione. They need Hermione in this franchise. And the fact that she is such a strong character has a good balance to Harry's recklessness and bravery along with Ron's kind of like dumbness and the fact that um, it is a perfect counterweight and drives everything forward on top of the fact that her love story with Ron as we watch it progress is so sweet and so kind so it gives the movies kind of a human arc so Hermione's not only the best witch she's also the best from an emotional standpoint she's a great character Fine. okay Joe 45 seconds when you start talking Neville Longbottom essentially starts out as this sort of bullied 
put upon character. You see him going through all these difficulties. He's sort of a laughing stock in the very early parts of Philosopher's Stone. But at the end of Philosopher's Stone, he comes out, he has that hero moment. He has that standing up because he will stand up not only against his enemies, he will stand up against his friends. And you see that progression of Abigail when he starts to have his glow up around Goblet of Fire. You see this development of the character. You start to learn more about this character and what his parents had been through with Bellatrix and Strange and all this other stuff. And you see this coming through. You see him becoming stronger. And you see him becoming more confident. He may legitimately even be the chosen one. And then he has that final moment of destroying the final Horcrux. You know, this is a character who is built up at the very start of the movies as a bit of a laughing stock. And then it comes up. You see him grow, become more confident, become more powerful. And then he has that final moment. He gets to be that hero. And he gets and even has that final moment of declaring his love for Luna in that final right. moment. Yeah. Yeah, striking from the record, Jacoby, 30 seconds. See, I think you kind of said it yourself that Neville is too much of a laughing stock throughout like the middle of the movie. Yes, he has his good hero moment at the beginning and his hero moment at the end, but then there's like seven movies in the middle where he's kind of just a laughing stock. And that and that's like that's that's just not the best character in the Wizarding World. The best character in the Wizarding World is someone who can actually drive the plot kind of forward in more interesting ways, and that's Hermione because she's at the central of everything going forward. She balances out the main three in a way that's so different than everybody else and is so strong and powerful in her own independent right, where she's like the best witch that you can ever see. Neville may be the chosen one at some point, but Hermione actually has the skill to back it up and prove why she's so great i'm muted great striking from the record uh joe 30 seconds when you start talking Hermione essentially serves as a deus ex machina to Harry throughout the series, okay, until Harry becomes an actual confident and capable wizard. You know, she's the one that's like, oh, I read this in a book, oh, I read this in a book, oh, I read this in a book, oh, great, you don't actually see her actually learning it, but what you do see with Neville, you see him developing as a character from that moment in Goblet of Fire when he comes out, so I'm going to be the first one to dance, coming back, me, Look at me growing as a person. You know, me, I stayed out later than anybody else. It's only the beginning of Philosopher's Stone where he's really the laughing stock. He has the hero moment at the end of that. And each time it goes on through that, of him being the confident character, him taking his journey forward, taking his journey, understanding, dealing with that pain of his parents. You don't see that from Riney. You just see her being a know-it-all the whole time. Time. Okay. Tim. Yes, sir. Can I message you a fact check question? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, we good? Mm -hmm. Mark, you're kicking us off. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it was a really good match. Um, and, yeah. and frankly, like the speed round question, uh, it's like perfect cherry on top of this. I think, uh, though, I think just kind of at least one of these one of these guys has had I think more machine gun points at least for their character and I kind of thought that was Jacoby the best one. Um Yeah, this was weird. Um <laughs> not the picks I was expecting. Well, that's not true. I should rephrase that valid picks um but different than i was expecting the reason i phrased it character not hero villain i didn't want someone to just straight up be like bellatrix or voldemort or hermione or whatever because i thought that um phrasing it character you could pick either side of things both went the hero side of things and um definitely didn't go the way i would have thought i thought i would have heard a um serious black or a lupin or those types of things but we got very grounded characters that we see all the time i went with jacoby um i thought that in the instance of neville versus hermione which i think on paper isn't a fair fight but I think Maggie's not laughing at me. She's reading TikTok or something, Instagram. Uh, she, I think the, um, Joe did more for Neville than I would have expected. I thought that Joe was going to say a Bellatrix, Lupin, Voldemort, someone. And he came out with, with Neville. And I was like, this is over. Um, but I thought he did a good job. 
at the end of the day, though, I think Jacoby just had all the ammo, like Mark said. Hermione's just too strong of a character um, who does a lot in these movies to make it uh, worth it. So, Kirk, your vote doesn't count, but where would you have gone and why? Um, well, it would have been another clean sleep because I also want Jacoby. I think they both did a good job and, you know, just, you know, behind the scenes, what I was getting clarification on is the whole, uh, is Neville the chosen one? Uh, and I conferred my, my thoughts that that's more of a book thing than a movie. Um, so I think like, there's a lot of like lore around, uh, Neville. And I've always thought this, that there's more lore around Neville than we actually are exegetically in the movies. Uh, so, um, I feel like it came down to, um, who may just made the best, you know, points. And I think the fact that Jacoby said, you know, we, Hermione's there every movie, making a difference, making an impact on the characters, on the group. Um, I think that's uh, wh wh why I went that way. Um, but I think they both, again, did a great job fighting their points. All right. Well, that means your winner is Jacoby Bancroft. We are going to get into post-match interviews. We're going to start by talking to Joe. Joe, listen. Um, I've said it at the beginning of each of your matches, this run, this incredible run you've been on that, you know, like you hadn't really found success in fan zone yet. I think you've found success. I think if you were going up against anyone other than Jacoby, you would have won this match. And that's easy to say as like someone on the back seat that's not playing, that's not managing, but I truly mean that this was one of the closest debates we've ever really had. Lots of queen clean sweeps, only one um, split decision. But I truly feel like this was one of those matches where we really could have gone either way. And I think you played really fantastic, man. I know it must be disappointing not going to the title match, but... I, I give you all the props as someone who has also lost to Jacoby before and knowing that like, man, he plays so good. It's like, man, you know, he like, he deserves the win, but also, Oh, I really wanted that one. I, I know how I, I, I feel like I know how you feel. How are you feeling about the match coming out of it? Yeah. There's a little bit of disappointment there, of course, but I think it, it's quite funny that both of us got the points on the strengths we chose. I think that, Think speaks a lot about what maybe edged it out when they were that close is maybe just that little bit of extra passion look jacoby's just fierce and i said at the start i said maybe i hope the time it is might not affect hopefully doesn't affect the ability to think on my feet and maybe just towards the end that may be what what happened um because that's the only thing i couldn't really prepare is that speed round speed round question um it's tough because the action scenes in two towers fucking slap and Michael Caine fucking slaps in my Muppet Christmas Carol. And when he picked those, I had to go, right, I can't pick another Lord of the Rings movie because then it's just the similar scenes versus similar scenes. I have to go for something completely different in terms of what the scenes are. Yeah, man, I appreciate that strategy. That's smart. And the same with Michael Caine. I, like, you know, everyone sort of, you know, I, I, Muppet Christmas, Muppet Treasure Island is like my movie. And I could have gone with Tim Curry, but you can hit those one note sort of arguments there a little bit. So you've got to go, What's not that? <laughs> What's not same, but where, where do you go different? Even if it's not your number one pick, sometimes you have to pick what can I argue better? And sometimes sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. And yeah, Jacoby's just yeah, fierce, fierce debater. And it's yeah, it happens. And uh, I'm looking forward to having some more time to prepare for maybe getting to a title match and having some other matches to play where I can get to that sort of level because that was incredible. Joe, you are going to get to play some other matches. Uh, you are going to, even though you lost this match, um, obviously you're still at a high record. You're going to be moving on actually into the next title picture, but you are going to have to play a couple matches to get back up there again. Um, same type of situation you were in this time. You're going to have to win two matches in order to uh, get, up to the uh, end all be all, uh, whoever the champion is, either Jacoby or Cody. So, um, 
some of the people that are in this next uh, picture. You got your co-hosts. Uh, Brian Michaels is actually returning to the ring, so you're going to see him. Nazario, Rue, um, Bill Cariola, Cameron Holtzman, and the person on the call, Kirk Kolkowski, who you've played before. Uh, so, so those are some of the people that are going to be in this picture with you. Anybody that you want to face? Um, out of those, I think the most fun would definitely be Rue because Rue and I did a lot of studying together back before, I think before we were even joined Multiplex when we were in other leagues. We were, there was a lot of studying together. Uh, Rue and I have got a really good um, friendship, former teammates in another division. So that that would be really fun. Kind of want to get me on back on Nazario for that last speed round I lost. So, um, but yeah, Kirk as well, a little bit of revenge there. Um, if, if, you know, making people laugh is going to win the match, then I don't want to play Bill because that guy steals every um, stream he's on. So, <laughs> you know. That's, that's fair. Uh, Joe, I'll argue something pirates with Toho. Why not? Yeah. Or that's that's fair too. Joe, <laughs> fantastic job tonight. Uh, really, I I say it a lot when I say like, great job. Oh, so we'll see you next time. But, Joe, I truly mean it. Like, you played fantastic tonight. Uh not a slouch at all. You really put Jacoby to the test, and I can't wait to see who you play next because it, it's going to be nasty, whatever it is. So, <laughs> Joe, fantastic job. We'll see you next time as we bring in Jacoby. Jacoby, you're going on to play for a title. You're going on to play Cody. Uh, your thoughts first, though, uh, against your match against Joe. How do you oh. feel about Oh man, I can't give enough praise and fear from like Joe. Joe did so well in that match. I was sweating, and he's just like, "Oh, I always sweat." But you know, there's some matches where I think like, "Okay, I know I, 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 I could have won, or I should have won, or or something." Or like, I know that I did win. Like this one was just like, "Frick, man!" Like he was just coming in with some arguments on like every single question that like I just could not like I, I didn't really know that hard how to counter. Like, and he he had made such excellent points, and his delivery was great, and everything about it was was fantastic like that like any other it could have gone either way um and i really just commend that i feel very lucky to you know um in that situation so all hats off to joe um for that so because that was that was a lot of fun oh but that was thrilling and that was passionate but he was he said it best when he says like oh we both won like our, our strength categories which was good because like you know i really wanted to win the rocky one um i knew i was gonna i, I knew the the middle earth one was gonna be hard but it, like I, I totally thought like i thought i came into the muppets question like this is easy i kept going back to his message about like to make sure that i understood like the question and like why he picked that because i was just like what is he doing here and then he came out with this just really just smart kind of argument and you heard him say like how he you know broke it down and did some encounter things so that he could fight against it and that was great so um he's very scary and i'm very scared for what's next but i'm very happy thank you judges thank you everybody hey ramble I see, Tim, you, you didn't want to listen to what I had to say. I so heard you everything you said. Sorry. <laughs> I, see what uh, <laughs> I had to step away for a moment, but I did. I took my computer with me, so I heard everything. Um, Jacoby. Yes, Joe was a formidable uh, foe, but you are going up against uh, Mr. Newberry in the title match. Now, I'm trying to remember. I don't know if you've been in a title match, or did you play? I feel like you might have played Kirk. For a type, uh, like again, like a second time, like after I lost it. Yes, but I could I, be wrong. I could I, be wrong about that. Either way, it's been a while since you've been in the title match. I don't. I don't actually think you've been in a title match since you lost to Kirk. Um, but you've you've gotten close many mm -hmm. times. Yeah. And uh, now you're going up against Cody, who is a different beast than yeah. Kirk. Um, and this is going to be an exciting one. I think that, um, you and Cody having worked together now for over a year in the fandom side of things, um, it's going to be, it's going to be different than playing Kirk. It's going to yeah. be different than playing me. Um, I think that this is going to be an exciting one, one that we've kind of wanted to see and one that you guys have played before. He actually beat you, uh, to go on to play, uh, Kirk the first time i believe um yes, so and i made him and i made him pretty mad 
I remember quite was frankly. Was it a Jurassic Park question, I believe, maybe? Uh, I think, okay. So he always says that, like, I called him an idiot, and I did not call him an idiot. What <laughs> I did was, like, he was saying things. He's like, he keeps interrupting things, and I'm like, then say smarter things, like, or something like that. <laughs> so I did not call him an idiot, um, and it got a little heated there. But now, so that as, was a- as <laughs> Maggie <laughs> likes that one. As someone who would would self-profess is Cody Newberry's best friend. <laughs> I can tell you with certainty that if you were to say to him, Cody, say smarter things, <laughs> that he would be very upset and feel like you called him. An I did. And then I, I got heated. I remember I got heated in that match. And he, I remember him afterwards. He got really mad when he was just like, I can't, uh, you know, like if he, if he keeps interrupting me, I'm not going to do this anymore. I was like, Ooh, you're right. Well, that's, that's your fault, Cody, for getting me so passionate. <laughs> Super funny that we're that we're pretty good friends now. So now oh it's gonna be even funny. Is our is our friendship? I don't even if our friendship gonna crumble. Is it gonna become stronger? No, I think here's the here's the thing, Jacoby. I think that you and Cody have differing uh debate styles, and I do think that seeing you two go head to head again almost a year and a half later, about because that was at the end of 22 that you guys played. Jesus. I think Cody's in a totally different headspace. And that first time you guys played, he was on the hunt for a title that he didn't end up winning. Now he's holding on to that belt, trying not to lose it. And you, and like you said, you guys have a great friendship now. So does that change things? I don't know. We'll see when we get to the match, but uh, Jacoby, I'm really looking forward to it. I think this run you've been on is really, really great. And uh, I think it should also be said that while maybe matches have or have not been filmed, you, Jacoby Bancroft, over the course of one weekend, are in three separate title matches in multiplex entertainment. Uh, you're in a, a war or war zone. Jesus Christ. You're in a melee <laughs> singles title match. You're in a fandom teams title match. And now you're going to be in a fan zone debate uh, ah. title match. So um, I'm super excited for you, Jacoby. I never want to bet against Cody Newberry in a debate, but Jacoby, I think you got a good chance of going up against Cody and, and, and grinding his gears one could say so oh, Jacoby, good good luck in the title match we'll see you in uh, a couple weeks with that but we're gonna get final thoughts we'll start by talking to mark uh yeah this was, this was a really good match it, it went back and forth it, it was funny like it just it felt like every fight was close although we had four clean sweeps in here there's only one not like which is kind of weird but i mean no uh, Joe played really well. I think he's he came in kind of after you know, kind of playing those couple matches. I think he was definitely ready to play Jacoby here. He took him to the limit, and then I think Jacoby did kind of what we all figured he'd do like just come out, come out really intense, really bring it, and then just kind of happened to have that edge going in that speed round. But now, um, getting a Jacoby in the title match of Cody, it is going to be fun. Kirk, final thoughts from you. Yeah, great match. Uh, as a judge, um, you almost hope that at least one person will suck because it'll make your job so much easier. Um, but, you know, the upside is the great fights, but it's really hard decisions. The stat sheet will not show how close this was. Um, I think this is th- – no, I can say for sure this is definitely the closest uh, match I've judged in a while, if not ever. Um, I said at the beginning about Joe taking next step, even though he didn't win this match. I think we saw him take that next step. Um, I think we've seen him. I, I consider him now after this match, one of those players who I just assume when I see him in a preliminary match, I'm going to assume he wins that match. Um, I think he's that he's one of those guys now where he is. He is one of the few that you assume is going to be in a title match eventually. So congratulations to him. I'm glad to see um, him stepping up in that role. I, I want to see more players do that. Um, congratulations to Kobe. I'm really excited for him. Um, you know, like you said, three title matches could not happen to a better person. Uh, very happy for him. Very proud of him. Uh, but um, him versus Cody, I think it's going to be another great fight. I think yeah. 
I mean, me, Cody, uh, Jacoby, I think, there, you know, maybe a few other names. I think there are a few people who um, really can just hit that high level. And um, I'm sorry, I put myself that was so conceited. I hate when people do I, but I, I agree. suck. I would have said it. I suck. I'm terrible. I haven't won a match in two years. You're um, not Coho. Shut up. You're but, uh, fine. <laughs> Um, but no, um, I think Jacoby is definitely that guy um, that can really give Cody a great match. And I think it'll be a really good challenge for Cody. And I'm excited to see it. For the record, because I don't want Kirk to feel bad. When you're saying it, when you have stuff to back it up, it's <laughs> fair, Kirk. Uh, so uh, congratulations to Jacoby, but also like Kirk said, congrats to Joe, because I think he played a great match. Uh, so thank you to Kirk and Mark for judging this one. Thank you to Brian and Cody behind the scenes for helping run this thing. Uh, thank you to everybody at the multiplexes and who played in this match and helped this match. It was a fantastic one. I've been Tim. We will see you guys with the next match. And as always, be sure to season those fries. We'll see you on the next one. Bye. There we go. Thank you very much. Please come again. We have a lot more groceries.